politics and journalism are so much alike, you know, um, as a as an editor, having been seduced by the dark side of the force when I was a reporter, uh, the bottom line is always, what have you done for me lately? Um, that's why I basically tried to look at the economics, the bottom line in Liberia. Uh, I've been to several countries, and I was in Somalia um, for the invasion, I was in Haiti, and one of the things I really wanted to do to try to bring the story home to folks was like, how do people survive? What kinds of jobs do they have? How do they feed their families? Um, so I did a lot of stuff on economics, and I think the thing that was most challenging about Liberia is that, you know, Liberia has had two civil wars. They've had 14 years of war in the last 21. They've had 30 years of political stability. So I was interested to see how the economy is working. You have a country that has an official unemployment rate of about 85 percent, and that was just staggering to me. Um, one of the first things that we did, and I just wanted to, number one, first give complete uh, credit to my colleagues and also to John Shedlowski and Louise Leaf. Um, I've done a lot of gigs in a lot of different places. I've never had a producer who is as competent and as hardworking as either one of these people. Uh, <laughs> I do not know how we made every single appointment. I think we had about 20 appointments every day. And I don't, need, I don't know, I don't even think we slept. But anyway, I wanted to thank I wanted to thank both of them and my colleagues. But one of the first things we did was, you know, when you're preparing for a, one of these gigs, you sort of look at the history and the history of Liberia as a modern state, uh, and the Firestone Corporation are there's a symbiotic relationship which goes way back, uh, when a nearly bankrupt Liberian government, which was concerned about being in, invaded, signed a deal with Harvey Firestone Jr. in 1926 and gave away 10% of the country's arable land to establish what is the Firestone Plantation. And, you know, as an African-American, when anyone mentions the word plantation, I have to sort of get a little, uh, <laughs> sort of get a little nervous. So we went out to the Firestone Plantation, which is on more than 100,000 square acres. It's the largest um, natural rubber plantation in the world. And we got to see how it was tapped and they told us about you know how they do things, I mean, and we met with staff. That's employing about 7,000 Liberians. About 15,000 of their dependents live on you know live on this uh, uh, property. But one of the great things that we did is that you know Firestone basically had the dog and pony show. I didn't see the pony there, but <laughs> I did see the dog. And there was in as a Baltimore, as a, a resident of Baltimore, one of the things that was great was <coughs> executive director of Firestone Liberia had a really strange accent. It's from Dundalk, which is uh, outside of Baltimore, which is where he grew up. Um, and to hear them give the spiel about, you know, investing in the country, and that's one good thing. But there's another side to that, too. And Louise was great in being able to find out Green Advocates, which is a local NGO, which has basically been holding Firestone's uh, feet uh, to the fire. Um, you know, alleged ch charges of alleged dumping and collusion with the government. That was one very, very interesting thing because it's something that really doesn't come out. And then you go into Firestone's history, you know, right after Firestone um, started the plantation, the Liberian Army press ganged the locals uh, by the thousands to work on this fire plantation, which, of course, coincided with the rise of the auto-making industry in the United States. And, of course, I grew up in Highland Park, Michigan, which was, of course, the site of the world's first auto assembly line, it, right about a, a mile from where I grew up. So I sort of saw a personal sort of commitment. But I wanted to see how Liberia could make a go of things, because one of the things that, that I had thought we were going to do when we went to Liberia was continue to write an obituary. You know, this is a country, a failed state that was dead. There was nothing to look forward to. It was completely destroyed. No one would want to come in and do anything. And when we got there, a lot of that post-war, a lot of the, the war damage has been sort of painted over and filled up and everything. But you're looking at a country with a very small population, only three and a half million, which has huge mineral wealth. We're talking, you know, they got diamonds. Uh, they had some, made some discoveries of uh, uh, offshore oil, which they think will be coming on. Um, they have, of course, the rubber. They have 
timber and uh, the Chinese and the European consortium have just signed seven billion dollars worth of deals to restart their iron ore mine iron ore mining they also have location um, Steve remembers the old days um, when he used to get on what was commonly called to was the milk run where you had Pan Am I guess went through West Africa and Liberia Delta just started direct flights to Liberia which takes seven hours uh, one note, uh, I was unhappy with one aspect of uh, the trip, and that's because Louise decided to take an American carrier to Brussels. And then we took the Southwest Airlines of the European carriers, um, Brussels Airlines, to get to Liberia. So my back has still not recovered, Louise. And I hope you don't do that to any other peacekeepers. But the, the fact of the matter is, is that Liberia has a lot of good points going for it. And for example, Delta is flying into Roberts Field Air Force, which the U.S. Army built in World War II to help resupply the troops to North Africa. So it is now larger than Kennedy, LaGuardia, and Dulles Airport combined. There's a huge potential there, and um, what is it, Lockheed Martin is actually on the ground there trying to restore that. So I figured you got small population, great location, you have mineral wealth, how can you, you know, my thing is how can you turn this around? Because Liberia was a failed state. And to me, how do you get it turned around? How do you make it relevant uh, for the Liberians themselves? Because it's great when you talk about foreign investment, but if the people on the ground can't feel it, touch it, smell it, it doesn't mean anything at all. So that's one of the things that was the, the, one of the big complaints that we got, um, all of the peacekeepers, there were two ones, there, were, there was corruption, because a lot of foreign investments coming in, people see things being done, but they don't see anything in their pockets. And the second was roads, infrastructure, because the infrastructure of the country was devastated. I think there are only 500 miles of paved roads uh, in a country of three and a half million. Um, now, Firestone has about 400. Yes, that's right. On the plantation, they have about 400 miles of paved roads there. Um, they're getting investment in, in Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who is a former uh, World Bank economist, said that the country will not need, told us, the country will not need any foreign aid within 10 years. Well, that sounds really ambitious for a country that was just absolutely destroyed. <coughs> um, they do have competent leadership. Um, you can see some of the signs, and of course, Steve has the eyes of someone who has seen Liberia through the years. Um, I came out of the trip, I did one piece on economics, but I'm going to revisit this. I came out of this trip uh, fairly optimistic about Liberia's future, and that's unusual because the countries that I'm usually in, uh, the indicators are down, and you're expecting that things are going to get worse. Liberia has tremendous challenges, but it seems like they have a competent, uh, they have a competent leadership, uh, political leadership. Uh, I've talked with businessmen who are dealing with Liberia, and it's not like jumping through hoops in Nigeria or Kenya or Egypt or some places like that. So they're encouraging investment and people are, are going in. So that was the thing that really sort of surprised me. I did not expect to go to Liberia and feel optimistic, uh, even mildly optimistic about its future.